Thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, maybe just a brief intro about myself. You know, I mean, I, I see some uh, familiar faces, but also some new faces. Okay, I'm, uh, my name is Jeffrey, Say S A Y, is my surname. And uh, I, I teach at LaSalle College of the Arts. Uh, in fact, currently what I'm doing now is uh, I run the uh, a master's program in Asian art histories, and I've left some brochures. You know, um, you know, some of you have the brochures. And uh, if you're interested in that program or that course, okay, do uh, come and uh, you know uh, have a chat with me. Okay, we start our next uh, batch in January, right? And uh, application actually closes in October. Okay, so uh, for and and one of the highlights of this program is actually a study trip that uh, we do. Uh, you know, around the region. All right. So um, yes. So give it a thought if you are interested. Oh, I see more people. Okay. Okay. In any case, uh, okay. Let's begin the, the the lecture. And before I kind of start, you know, I'd like to see how many of you here. I know some collectors like to remain anonymous, right? <laughs> okay. But uh, maybe if I can have a show of hands, how many of you here collect art, right? Or are collectors in? Okay, all right, quite a number. Some are a bit reluctant, you know, hesitant to put up. Okay, never mind. In fact, uh, if you look at collectors today, you know, they are no longer kind of, uh, they're coming out of their isolation, right? And uh, some collectors have, uh, are setting up uh, what you call it, eponymous museums, you know? That means museums named after themselves, okay? Some of them are curating, organizing shows, okay? So they're they coming out of that, and again, they are no, no longer, you know, remaining anonymous. Um, Right, you know, whenever I give a talk or I conduct short courses for adults or, or in my, my class at LaSalle, right, I'm, uh, in, there'll always be a question, okay, as to, you know, what makes this work worth a million dollars or a hundred million dollars, right? Or what makes this work worth five million and another work worth five thousand dollars, right? And, you know, my, my response will always be, you know, it's due to a complexity of factors. Right. And I'll take too long to explain it, you know. Right. But I'll normally give one or two reasons, right, factors for that. But I think this uh, talk will give me an opportunity to, um, you know, uh, address maybe more fully, okay, and, uh, you know, some, some of the factors that, you know, make, uh, or rather, some of the factors that um, affect the price of a work of art. Now, I think in the last one or two years, you see a lot of this, either in the Straits Times, you know, or in other newspapers, or online, right? Global art sales reaching pre-crisis high, $83 billion. Okay, Asian artists setting new auction records. Okay, art auction rips, rips healthy, $357 million. In fact, just this year, um, in May, I think Christie's and Sotheby's broke all records for sales, right? I think over a billion dollars, right? Okay, now, how does all this, you know, news affect the way we see art? Okay, I think it does, right? Because uh, increasingly, if you're exposed to such news, we begin to see art, you know, as a commodity, right? We begin to equate art with money. Okay, and we begin to um, have the perception that um, the best artists are the most expensive ones. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that those are wrong, but you know, th those are like, uh, quite dangerous assumptions to make. Claude Monet, you know, an auction favourite. Uh, you know, whenever an auction, uh, 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 Monet you know, goes you know, to auction, you, you'll you'll be assured that there'll be a lot of, you know, frenzy or, or buzz around it. Um, this is uh, part of his uh, Poplar series. Okay, Monet, of course, you know, he, he was uh, probably the only impressionist who did a series of um, paintings based on the same subject, so as to capture, you know, the light, okay, at different times of the day. Right, so if you look at this painting, it's part of his Poplar series. Right, it's a wonderful painting of a very you know, sinuous ass of a row of poplar trees. Right? But sometimes the more you look at it, the more it becomes a dollar sign. Okay? It looks like a dollar sign. <laughs> right? Okay? Do you see it? And Monet is not spelled M-O-N-E-T, it's spelled M-O-N-E-Y. 
Okay, because <laughs> Monet is money. Right. Okay, and you know, owning a Monet is a, or Monet is a, a status symbol, right, to many people. Well, Andy Warhol, and you know, we are not surprised that he'll, he'll make such statements. Success is what sells, right? Because I think Warhol was really the, the, one of the first, uh, you know, uh, kind of superstar of the art market, of the art world, all right? And today, he's a, he's a kind of a perennial favorite, right, in the auction house, okay? And, uh, you know, with his uh, works, uh, you know, selling for uh, many millions of dollars, okay, and setting new records. Okay, so you have uh, just a very quick one, right? Um, you know, you have uh, various uh, uh, philosophers who pondered upon the value of art, right? Plato, okay, very famous uh, theory of mimesis, okay? And to him, you know, a painting is useless, okay? Uh, for example, a painting of a chair is useless because um, the chair itself, right, um, you know, is not the perfect form. And to Plato, the perfect form actually uh, is in some divine imagination, or what we call the realm of ideas. Okay, so the chair itself is an, the real chair itself is an imitation of the, the ideal form, the perfect form. Okay, so all painting is used because it's just an imitation of an imitation. Right? Um, now to, um, you know, to, to other philosophers like R.G. Collingwood and Leo Tolstoy, okay, they value the communicative um, you know, aspects of art. Okay, and uh, Collingwood said that you know, art can communicate certain fundamental truths and insights. Okay, and an artist actually can clarify his ideas and feelings when he makes a work of art. And he can share the idea and feelings with right, the viewer. Okay, and that's a, a kind of, uh, that's, that's the same idea that probably uh, Leo Tolstoy had. Okay, it's, uh, you know, from his, uh, his uh, book, I can't remember the, what is art, right? His book, What is Art? And, where you know, he has this uh, um, kind of theory that art should be infectious, okay? that the viewer should be feeling what the artist has felt. Okay? So art should be infectious. Ed Reinhardt okay, also you know, uh, you know, warns against uh, artists selling themselves. And he says the ugliest spectacle is that of artists selling themselves. Okay, art as commodity is an ugly idea. Okay, so there were some, uh, you know, artists who kind of, um, you know, object to this idea of art as a commodity. Okay, and he makes a statement that artists as businessmen is uglier than the, the businessman as artists. Okay, <laughs> right. Okay, um, you know, so we shouldn't equate the value of art with all these things, intrinsic value. Okay, I believe that art has an intrinsic kind of value with an inviolable quality, okay? Uh, you know, because a work of art is made, uh, it's a unique work of art, it's a unique object that was made at a specific point in time, okay? Um, and, you know, and, and it transcends, you know, time and place, okay? And a work of art can speak directly to you, right? Okay, without attaching any commercial value to it. Okay, it's funny how, you know, if, you know, imagine that there's no art market, there's no auction house, okay? So you just, you look at works of art differently, let me tell you, right? Because if you look at art in terms of dollar signs, you know, it, it, you'll miss a lot of things, right? Um, social value, okay, I mean, a work of art should be something that, you know, brings people together. That's the whole idea, okay? It's meant um, to be seen, Right, that's why museums are set up, okay? And uh, I think it's sad that, you know, some collectors buy works of art and, you know, kind of uh, put it in their, their safe for free pot, you know, right? Okay, never, never to be seen again, okay? Because I, I think it should be shared, it should be seen by people, by the community, right? So you have, I mean, on your, on your sheet, sorry, I've, I've changed a couple of wordings and, you know, um, I've added in a couple of slides as well, right? Okay, I think in your, in your, on your um, copy it's called change of taste. I've changed it to taste or trendsetter. Um, that can affect, you know, uh, you know a, 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 ten, a trendsetter, you know, can also affect the value of, uh, of an artwork. Okay, and of course, the, 
you know, and who are these trendsetters or taste setters? Okay, they are normally, it, it seems that collectors are probably the most uh, powerful among this, you know, this taste of trendsetters. Of course, you have people like critics or curators who can also have, uh, you know, influential or, or powerful influence as well, okay, on uh, what is uh, hot now, you know, right? What, what is uh, fashionable today? Okay, but it's really, I, I would say, collectors who are probably the most uh, powerful, right? Uh, taste of trendsetter, okay? Um, certain collectors, that's it, that is, right? Like Charles Sachi, okay? And, um, you know, Charles Sachi, uh, I think uh, is a name that's familiar to some, if not most of you, right? He made his money in the advertising, uh, you know, uh, line, okay, Sachi and Sachi. And uh, he also started collecting art, okay? He started quite early in his 20s, right? He collected um, uh, American art, okay? Right, American art, like those of, I, I think, uh, Donald Judd and people like that, okay? But um, later on, he, he, um, he decided uh, not to collect American art anymore, okay? When he visited, I think that was in um, 19, early 90s, if I'm not mistaken, okay? Um, visited a, a show at Goldsmiths, uh, college, okay, a show that was um, curated by Damien Hirst. Okay, in any case, right, he would go to this college, right, he saw the works and he bought them. Okay, and that really changed. In fact, that really helped to catapult, you know, uh, British contemporary art, okay, which at that point in time, you know, have been, you know, was not really, uh, you know, uh, was, was still lying low. But, you know, after that, you know, it changed things. And, um, and of course, in 1997, you know, he, there was this exhibition called, controversial exhibition called Sensations, okay, featuring the works of the young British artists. So he bought the works of the young British artists, they were, they were called the young British artists, okay, Damon Hurst, of course, being the leading member of that group. And then you have Tracy Amin and uh, Rachel White Reed, okay, and people like that. Okay, so 1997, that show also, although it's controversial, I think, you know, really um, um, launched their careers, right? It, it traveled to New York, okay? And, uh, and they have not looked back since. I mean, you know, the young British artists. Although today they are no, no longer that young, eh? right? Um, and this is really one of the most recognizable work, okay, of, the, of, uh, of Damien Hirst, okay? Um, physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living, right? And it was uh, actually Charles Sachi who commissioned this work from Damien Hirst. And he bought this work, he purchased this work in 1992. Okay, Damien Hirst, uh, you know, went to, I mean, he got an Australian shark hunter, okay, Vic Hislop, okay, to, to hunt a tiger shark, right? And Vic Hislop got a tiger shark, and, um, you know, and he would suspend that shark in formidable height in a glass tank, okay? And if you know, uh, Damien Hirst's work, it deals a lot with um, mortality, okay, and notions of death, okay, when you're com confronted with this, uh, this monster, right? And uh, that was, and the, the commission was for 50,000 British pounds, okay? And this work was so, I can't remember, remember the exact date, to um, the hedge fund billionaire, Steve Cohen, for, he said, Eight or twelve million dollars, right? And Charles Archie is very good at doing that. Okay, making a lot of money from his, you know, his collection. He's more a dealer than a collector as well, right? Okay, and by that time the shark has deteriorated. You know, here we talk about condition. Okay, and they had to actually stretch the skin on fiberglass, right? So it was not the same as the original. But um, Damien Hirst uh, did a favor for Steve Cohen. Okay, he did a second work for him. But of course, Steve Cohen paid, the, paid the, um, the cost of that, right? So he got another shark, you know, hunted down and, you know, to replace the original shark. Okay, that's Charles Sachi for you. And he's really a trendsetter because uh, he's, he's one who would go to uh, college shows, you know, college art exhibitions or cutting-edge art fairs, okay? And then he would spot, you know, certain works that he liked and he would buy them. Okay, and of course, those young artists who, whose works he bought, Okay, would, um, would benefit, but not all the time. Okay, not all the time. I mean, it can also d destroy their career. Okay, uh, there's this uh, Italian artist called Sandro Chio, okay, where, you know, um, 
Charles Archie bought his works and then later on dumped them onto the art market. Okay, we don't know quite what happened, but Sandro Cho never recovered from that. Okay, he never recovered. Okay, in fact, Charles Archie, you know, he resold okay, all of Sandro Cho's work into the secondary market. Okay. Bidding at the auction. Um, you know, actually, uh, I have a couple of clips to show you, but uh, I don't. If I have time, I'll show you. But if not, you know, there are about a minute clip, okay, where you are able to see how, you know, and really, I would say that you know, rec records are set, really at the auction itself, okay, right? Because the auction itself is a unique set of circumstances at a specific point in time. It's really a bidding between two people, only two people, okay. And you have a battle of egos. What will happen? One is trying to outbid the other. Okay, and of course, if you have someone who works, who wakes up, or woke up at the wrong side of the bed, okay, who decides to you know, to just throw his money away and then later regret, you know, that could also happen. Okay, so many factors could affect, right, uh, the value of a work of art. Okay, and uh, you know, and the auctioneer as well can play a big role. Let me tell you. Okay, so that's why you have um, certain auctioneers who are well known because they're able to dictate how you know. Um, the, the auction goals, you know, right, and even to, to, to persuade or encourage, you know, uh, higher bidding for it. Okay, so all these uh, also play, you know, an important role, right, in setting the price of a work. Oh, that's, uh, by the way, Munch's work when it set a world record for $120 million US. That was just a couple of years ago. Uh, let me go on quickly now. Publications, I don't want to spend too much time, but of course, if an artist's work has been written about, okay, has uh, appears on stamps, okay, uh, and better still appears on the cover of an auction catalog, for example, okay, that will all increase, right, the value of the work. Okay, right, so, um, so this has to do with exposure, circulation as well. Uh, Fendi, okay, of course, you know, I mean, Fendi's works, you know, uh, he has been much written about and you know and and so you know his his, his works have um, established a certain kind of benchmark as well um, marketing right okay marketing not only on the artist part you know today a lot of artists are self promoters self marketers uh, as i said Warhol was the first one he's not the only one okay today you have people like jeff Koons, you know uh, damien hurst Okay, artists today are very savvy, you know. Sometimes I tell my students, well, you have to be a bit savvy to survive there, okay? Right, you have to promote yourself a little, but not to overdo it, you know. Um, it's important sometimes, okay, to, to market yourself, um, especially artists. And also, like galleries, galleries are getting more sophisticated the way they operate, right? Auction houses as well, they have diversified their business, okay? So everything has changed now, marketing, you know, can really, you know, push the price of a work of art, right, up. Okay, it can affect the work of art. Okay, the price of work of art, right? Um, you know, galleries are, are releasing press releases, for example, you know, preparing press re releases and all that, right? So, they are, everything is getting more sophisticated. Labor, media and materials. You know, the, the old way of calculating how much a work costs is this, man hours, you know, how much I spend on the work, right? You know, the cost of material. But let me tell you, the cost of material is minuscule, right? Okay, um, man hours. How do you calculate that? It's difficult. Okay, so so I'm not sure whether. Um, but rule of thumb again is that oil on canvas works. Okay, are uh, um, you know would would um, fetch higher prices than, for, for example, a drawing. Okay, that's a rule of thumb. Okay, and it seems that for drawing, um, colored. Drawings, uh, you know, uh, would fetch higher prices than monochrome drawings. Okay, so you have all these kind of, um, you know, and um, but that's not always necessarily so, right? Because in auctions, for example, drawings sometimes, uh, you know, would would uh, fetch higher prices than even works on oil, right? Okay, works in oil. Okay, and I, I'm not sure, right, whether materials also affect the work of art. The, the price of work of art because if you look at sculpture okay i mean why why do paintings you know um, are always valued higher commercially than sculpture okay i mean 
or those sculpture, you know, it's not it's not cheap to produce, you know, right? Especially the casting of it. Okay, even prints, you think of it, prints are not cheap, right? It's a complex process. Okay, but compared to painting, you know, prints and sculptures, you know, they don't fetch, you know, such a, you know, a high price. This I like this work by John Baldessari, all right, uh, a famous American artist, all right. Okay, all combined in an effort to give you a perfect painting. <laughs> okay. Catalogue raisonné. Okay. Catalogue raisonné is a, a listing of the complete works of the artist. And it will list out things like past and present collectors, the condition of the work, right, etc. Very important. It can affect the value of a work. Okay. In uh, between 2002, 2002 and 2004, okay, Andy Warhol's uh, ca uh, catalog resume, you know, was published, okay, of his works from 1961 to 1969, okay, and immediately that affected, that increased the value of his works, because you know, the perception is that uh, Warhol's work, uh, they are all quite similar, you know, right? That's a perception, but a catalog resume will show you that it's not true, okay? He, the work actually. All his works use different colors and they are of different skill. Right? And it also shows you that, well, you know, like you think it's Elvis and Coca Cola, you know, there, there are a lot out there. But actually, the catalog resonance shows you that there are, are not actually a lot. Okay? There are fewer than, than you actually think. Okay? And all this could affect right, the value of his works. Okay? So it's very important the catalog resonance. Right? Uh, you know, um, they are not cheap though, right? Okay? Uh, some say they are not inexpensive, it depends on your, you know, who buys them. Okay. Um, and sometimes it can affect a work adversely as well. If the catalog resume says that you know, the work uh, is in a bad condition, then you know, it can affect the value of that work as well. Okay. It can help you to establish, you know, to escape, to, you know, to, to kind of um, uh, uh, to play it safe as well. You know, for example, if you're going to buy a work, and then you check the catalog resume and it's not there. Okay, then you would um, you would find that well maybe you know it's not so safe to buy this work after all. Okay. So unfortunately in Southeast Asia, even in Asia, many artists don't have this catalog resume. Okay, right. Uh, and it can be very very useful. Okay, for collectors. Okay, condition. Now the last part I'm just going to sum up, right? so I'm going to go fast, right? Just going to tell about condition can affect a work of art as well. It seems that the difference between the excellent and good condition is about 15 to 20 percent of the actual price of the work. Imagine that, okay? Good and excellent that can mean mean a difference of 15 to 20 percent. And if the work is heavily restored or overpainted, sometimes you cannot even sell. Okay, so condition, you know. Um, uh, has a big part to play. You know, a few years ago, Steve Wynn, who is a casino mogul, he owned this, pain, um, he owned this painting by Picasso. English is called a dream. Um, what happened? Yeah, correct. <laughs> he was showing some people this painting. His elbow damaged the painting. And he was on the verge of selling the painting to Steve Cohen, whom I mentioned earlier. Okay? And I think the agreed price was about 130 million or so. 130 million. After that, he spent about $90,000 restoring the work, and the value went down to about 80 over million. But the last I heard is that it was actually sold, sold to Steve Cohen for 155 million. Imagine, so it's so invent, you know, higher than before it was damaged. And of course, it's a Picasso. I mean, come on, you know, it's a Picasso. Okay. Yeah, talking about Picasso, I mean, reputation is, is everything. Right, reputation is everything. You know, when this work this work sold a rec uh, set a record, right? Um, it, um, you know, this is a work called uh, "Boy with a Blue Pipe," and it's only a kind of a minor work, considered to be a minor work of Picasso. Okay, this was done during his blue period when he was first starting. Okay, it's not even his signature work. You know, his Cubist work. But imagine he broke the world record. Right. Of course, I said there are many factors, but you know, I believe that the reputation of artists, the Picasso, the brand name, okay, you know, can affect the sale as well. Right. So reputation is also everything. Right. It can affect the value of a work of art. Okay. Provenance very important. 
very important. Right? Who owns? Who who was who were the previous owners? Okay, of this uh, this work. Who's the person selling it? Right? What museum have this work been exhibited in? It can make all the difference. Right? If this work was owned by Frank Sinatra, for example, okay, I mean it would definitely you know uh, uh, can mean a, a difference, right? In the in the final price of the work. Okay, and that's what happened when David Rockefeller, uh, you know, saw this work uh, in uh, 2007. Okay, it's called it's now called the Rockefeller Rothko. Right? This actually the the actual name is called White Center, and um, Rockefeller only bought it for ten thousand. Okay, ten thousand. Right, but because it's owned by David Rockefeller, okay, right, the work was finally sold for seventy-three million. Right, and of course they were doing everything to increase the price of the work by getting Rockefeller to take a picture with it as well. Right, okay. Seventy-three million. So provenance, uh, it can mean a difference. Who owned the work previously? Okay. Um, Okay, uh, this is the last uh, part. I'm just going to summarize it. Okay, again, as I said, when I show you this, it's kind of a caution that you know one shouldn't measure everything in economic terms. Okay, like you know, to Damien Hirst, of course, you know, I mean, some artists are really driven by money. Okay, um, they, they they see art as a way of you know um, um, uh, making money. I suppose uh, they see nothing wrong with commoditizing, you know, um, artworks. Okay. You know, art today has become a commodity. Okay, um, I'll, I'll talk more about this later. And you know, let me just go through. That's what Karl Marx says: commoditization occurs when commercial value is assigned to things that are not generally considered in economic terms. Okay, so for example, um, slavery. When you have slavery, it means that people have been commoditized. Prostitution. Okay, likewise. I mean, sex. You know, has been commoditized. Okay, so when you commoditize things, that means uh, you know these things are, were not um, meant to be commoditized, but you have done it, right? Uh, it has become a product. Okay, so when something has become commoditized, it loses its uniqueness. Okay, it, use, it loses its uh, you know its kind of uh, its other value. Okay. Artists have become brand names. Okay, uh, many artists, in fact, uh, if you want to buy, um, for example. Uh, a Damien Hirst work, okay. You just say um, you don't, don't even have to mention the title of the work. You know, you just mention the the, the name of the artist, and that's good enough. It's a brand name. It's like buy, buying a Mercedes Benz. You know, a Volvo. Same thing. I want a, a, a Jeff Koons. You know, right? I want a Damien Hirst, right? Okay. Brand names. I want a Picasso. Okay. Um, so the art now no longer becomes important. Is the artist? Okay. Art has become a business. Big business. Okay, and uh, many kind of, um, in fact, uh, artists have entered into an unholy alliance okay, with uh, big business. You know, you have Murakami and uh, uh, Yayoi Kusama, okay, who, who, you know, who collaborate with uh, Louis Vuitton okay, right, for a series of products bearing their, their design. Okay, and also Hermes and you know, other big businesses you know, have been working with artists. Nothing wrong with that, but I said we have to be careful about art being too over commercialized, right? That we don't see it for what it is. Okay? Studios are now factories, you know. Okay, uh, you know, uh, Jeff Koons, you know, right? Jeff Koons, Jeff Koons Studio, for example, you know, has a couple of hundred people. Yeah, Murakami, Damon Hirst, okay, and they only, and and you know the the works that were done by the artist's hand are minimal. Okay, the rest were done by his assistants, right? As Jeff Koons say, you know, I am the ideas man, right? Okay, and the rest of it, the, the fashioning of the works, you know, the craftsmanship were all done by his assistants, okay? Same thing with, uh, you know, Damien Hirst and Murakami, okay? And Murakami, when he said, when he, you know, when he said, I'm finally going to paint my own works, you know, <laughs> that created a headline, you know, right? Okay, right, so, well, okay, so, and, so, you know, again, this, I mean, but people are still buying their works, even though, you know, you know that it's not by the artist's hand, 
Okay, one of the spot paintings, you know, many of the spot paintings were done by his assistants. Okay, by Damien Hurst's assistants, and not by him. Okay. And lastly, you know, Empress New Clothes Syndrome. You know the you know the story Hans Christian Anderson, right? Okay, where you know everybody saw that the emperor, you know, has clothes on or pretended to see. Okay, only the boy, you know, will shout, you know, the emperor has no clothes, right? Okay, now this syndrome is um describes the situation today where you know um we are afraid to disagree with the minority with the majority, you know, right? Where you know if people say that this is uh, uh, good and important, then you know we tend to you know to say yes, even though that we know that it's not you know it's bad art, you know, right? You dare not say because majority say, wow, it's good art, you know, right? This particular critic, very powerful critic, said it's good art, you know, right? Okay, and he has written uh, five thousand words on it, you know, right? You tend to go along with the flow, right? Okay, so we have to be careful of this. Uh, Okay, this syndrome. Just to show you some. <laughs> okay, uh, this one I pluck out of uh, out of C Arts. It's a it's an art magazine. I don't know how true it is. Okay, but it will it helps us to provoke. Okay, the way we think about art that we shouldn't just buy art, uh, you know, with in intention to sell for profits. Okay, we buy art first to enjoy it, and if you want to sell a profit later on, fine. You know, but um, it's called trading up, not for for profit. But you know, you trade up. Hmm. And yeah, talking about young British artists, you know, okay, commoditization. I mean, a work like this, you know, I, I'm not sure. I don't want to go into this debate about bad art, good art, what is art, you know. But for a long time, 15 years ago, when this was made, okay, there was a whole question of, you know, is this art, right? The, uh, Tracy Emin's work, my bed, it was bought by Charles Sachi in 2000, right? It's her own bed, her own bed, yeah, her own bed. Yeah, she slept on it. Uh, uh, you know, she spent her, her, her depressed years in it, okay, and she did a lot of more obvious things on it, lah, right? Because from the rubbish, you see, you know, there's uh, there's co used condoms and cigarettes. Uh, there's uh, uh, you know uh, alcoholic you know bottles and all that. Okay, her works are very autobiographical, right? Okay, it speaks about her life. Okay, and. Uh, if you and this work just this year yes july i have the date there right july the third 2014 sold for 5.3 million dollars oh, okay i see some uh, you know. yeah and she's she was aesthetic you know and it was sold by charles Sachi. imagine he bought it at, you know 14 years later i think he probably paid i don't know you know I, I i'm not sure how much he paid for it but probably less than a million you know Right, or less than even, you know, maybe in a six figure and sold for 5.3 million. Right? And the artist was there, in fact. It's rare for artists to be at auction, but she was there and, you know, she was aesthetic, you know, right? So for, for that amount of money. Okay? <laughs> um, yeah, that's what contemporary art is. Some people say contemporary art is all surface, all glossy, you know, that's what it is, right? Even for contemporary artists. Uh, you know, it, it lacks it lacks content. All it has is, is form. You know, right? So some critics of you know contemporary art say that, and of course Jeff Koons, he has. Uh, they are actually this is famous balloon dog. Okay. Now what Jeff Koons does is that he would take uh, you know, he would base his works on like um, objects of popular culture. Okay, like um, action hero figures like Hulk and all that. Okay, and uh, you know, uh, and, and turn them. You know, into these uh, monumental works, okay? Of course, uh, using different materials like stainless steel, you know, and, and other uh, materials. Um, and, and, and one characteristic of his work is, of course, the mirror like, the polished surface of his work. So his works look, they're almost, uh, you know, they display almost perfect craftsmanship. I mean, without a doubt, you know, the craftsmanship of this work is, you know, superb, all right? Okay, uh, but to pay $58 million. For balloon dog, okay. This was a record set this year, and there are only five balloon dogs of different colors, okay, at the hands of different private collectors. So no no balloon dog in uh, museums. They are all in private hands, right? And Jeff Koons, if you know him, he was a former um, stockbroker, okay. So he knows all about money. He knows all about how to promote himself, right? Okay, from doing those uh, pawn. Uh, Photographed with his uh, porn actress wife, okay, that made our Made in Heaven series, okay, 
right? And uh, to, to uh, creating sculpture of Michael Jackson with his uh, monkey, you know, pebbles, right? Okay, so it created very kitschy, you know, very kitschy works, okay, from, from popular culture. But his works are, you know, really in demand, you know, especially with, um, with high-end collectors, right? Okay, and, and I'm sure it's bound to, to break records again. Okay, with that, you know, I end my uh, talk. Thank you very much. No, we can take...